Thank you for joining us. Uh, please stand uh, and join us in singing, even if it is behind your masks. Um, we'll start with the song Cornerstone. <clears throat> Father, 
we thank you for giving us the opportunity to come today to worship with you. We thank you for the beautiful weather, the life that we see after winter, and just the beauty of the nature uh, that you provide around us. We thank you that you are a loving Savior. We thank you that you provide all of our needs, even in the midst of difficult times. We thank you that you are our Savior and our God. We pray that you'll just be with us during this time of worship. We pray that you'll be with Conrad also as he brings the word to us as we study this book of Romans that has so much to offer uh, and so much knowledge to provide to us. Be with this time of worship, this time when we gather around you in corporate worship together. In your name, amen. Okay, okay. Sorry, visitor up here. She won't stay seated without me, apparently. Um, it's great to see everybody on this beautiful Mother's Day. Uh, it's wonderful to have you guys here today. Um, just a quick update to begin with Pastor Eric, because there were some updates this week. Uh, Kim's father has passed away. I, think, I believe he died last Sunday um, after, after our church because they're, they're later than we are. But uh, just appreciate prayers for their family now, um, because it is a tough time, and they have a lot of considerations to think of um, with that. So I do ask that you just continue to pray for them. Um, but other than that, are, do we have any new visitors here who are here today? Because a tradition of ours is to welcome any new visitors um, that are here. So is there any new faces? We'd love to meet you. <laughs> ah, yes. If you guys would just mind standing, we'd love to yeah. meet you. <laughs> and just, you can tell us your name and where you're from. Vic Victor from Kenya. Stephanie from Germany. Nice to meet you guys. Well, afterwards, we will have fellowship outside. So we encourage you to join that because we'd love to talk to you and just get to know you a little better. Um, but other than that, just a few standard announcements that you've heard. We continue to have things online that we can do. Um, uh, even though we don't have a lot we can do in person at the moment, we still have our discipleship groups, Bible studies, prayer groups that I encourage you to join um, because that is a great way to stay connected during this time since we're not gathering like we normally would during the week, most of us. But um, also just a couple things I want to draw attention to is we do have two people who are going to be leaving today. Uh, I believe this is their last Sunday. Max, if you don't mind standing, I know this is going to be your last Sunday. Max has been living over uh, in Lund, studying there. And uh, even through Corona, as difficult as it can be to cross borders in these times, he's continued to make it a point to come. And it's been great to, to get to know him a bit. And we're thankful for his fellowship here. But also Gurley, and true to form, Gurley is not in here right now. She's outside uh, serving the, with the kids, I think, some of the kids that are out there. So I encourage you just to say uh, goodbyes and, and pray for Max, pray for Gurley, talk to them afterwards, because we are going to miss them greatly. Uh, their presence will be missed, but uh, we're thankful, Max, that, that you were here this past year, um, and we just pray that the Lord may bless you on all your new endeavors. But also, because it is Mother's Day, I would like to just ask, if you're a mother, would you stand, and so we could acknowledge you? All the mothers in here? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, on behalf of your children and your husbands, I just want to say thank you for all that you do. You're, as, as a father, I know that uh, without a mother, I don't think I would survive parenting. Um, so I just am thankful for you. Uh, I know some of your kids, those who are younger, and I know what wonderful parents you are and all that you, how you've poured into your kids. And we just are thankful for you and how you live out the gospel uh, in your life. Um, May, may, may I just pray for you while you stay standing? Father, we thank you for mothers. We thank you for the gift of motherhood. Um, without a mother, Lord, we know that none of us would be here. Um, and we just pray, Lord, for your blessing upon their lives. We know how much mothers give 
for their children, um, how much they go without. And we ask, Father, that your grace might fill them and empower them, Father, to serve uh, in the capacities that you've granted them. Lord, we, we, we are thankful for them, we love them, and we pray that in this day that they will know the depth uh, that the, of the love that their husbands have for them, that their children have for them. And help us, Father, to demonstrate our thankfulness in tangible ways to these who give us so much. Um, and we also pray, Father, for Gurley and Max as they, as they go, that you might be with them, Father. Uh, bless them as they leave this uh, place. We've been so thankful to have them here at FIBC. Yet we pray, Lord, that your spirit would guide them and lead them from here on out. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids now can be dismissed, uh, and you are welcome to just head on out there. Um, and then uh, Christian is going to come up and give us an update on new song. Shall we go? Shall we go to the next song? Yeah. <laughs> Let's um, prepare for continuing in worship um, by reading from Psalm 63. So Psalm 63, verses two to four. Give it a second before it comes up on the screen. Why don't we all stand and read it together? Because it's also much better to stand when we're singing as well. Psalm 63, 2-4. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. And following on the scripture, let's sing the song, Jesus, thank you. <laughs> the mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son We drank the bitter cup reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you, the Father's wrath Completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. By your perfect sacrifice. By your perfect sacrifice, I've been brought near. Your enemy you made your friend. Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace. Your mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Want your enemy now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul, lover of 
my soul, I want to live for you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Lover of my soul, Now we'll do our new song update. But uh, if, if you've been here for a while, you're familiar that we've been partnering with Christian to plant an international Danish speaking church. Um, for those who see themselves in Copenhagen and Denmark long term. So Christian, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing recently? Yes, thank you. I make all the annoying Facebook posts, so I just be good to get good to get up here and get face to face. So yeah, we've been kind of doing this in the corona times, which is must be work of the Lord because that's not maybe the most intuitive time to start a church, but it's been really good. We've been kind of going through some kind of core values of who we are and, and talking about how to grow in Christ kind of in the meantime. And our plan now is that we've been having these kind of hour meetings before the service, haven't had a lot of time together. So we're planning to do a couple of things over the next season. We're going to kind of go into rehearsal mode for starting a church service in the fall, which would be more of a public thing. We can invite our, our, our friends to that are maybe, you know, not church or, or um, you know, maybe just new. Um, but we're also going to try to go deeper into community. So one of the things we, we talk about is that at New Song, we want to be about the table, the pulpit, and the square. Those are kind of our rhythms. And so we're going to start doing um, church uh, from the table um, during this time. We're going to have kind of a house house fellowship gatherings uh, once a month, and then we're going to be, then we're going to practice kind of doing church from the pulpit once a month as well. So still two times a month. Um, and then we're also going to potentially add some more of a out, outreach church uh, in the square. So table, church from the table, church from the pulpit, church in the square. Those are kind of the rhythms we're exploring now, but it's kind of a time where we're going to be getting to know each other more. As you guys all know, FIBC too, we've been really limited in how much we can really eat together and, and just be together. So when we gather in our homes once a month, it's gonna we're gonna have a, a lunch afterwards and being a great time to kind of just get to know each other and fellowship. And so so that's that. We've got a good kind of regular team now. We feel really good about that of people that are kind of with us regularly and committed. And um, the next question is how do we kind of take that next step to to kind of go public with with the church. So we're so thankful for Conrad, for Pastor Eric, for for the support of the council. Um, to really have a mother church um, is such an amazing blessing. Many church planters don't have that. So we just want to say thank you to FIBC. Please keep praying for us. This is a big part of, of what we're doing as a church in terms of outreach right now. So please lift us up. And it, it's it does require a lot of perseverance. It's not easy. It's not for the faint of heart to plant a church at all, especially in Copenhagen. And so 
So thank you for your support and your prayers. And, and just come talk to myself, talk to Stephanie. If you have any questions or if you think there might be someone that you could invite, might be a good fit, feel free to share our Facebook um, um, posts or whatever. So thank you so much and worship well. Christian, you mind if we just pray for you real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Father, we pray for the work that Christian is doing. We pray, Father, for all those who are seeking uh, to serve you in the city and, and plant new churches and see the gospel uh, to be known to those, Lord, in this city who do not know you and do not know your saving grace. We pray, Lord, that you would just draw people to this work that Christian is doing, that you, Lord, would be in with this uh, church new song, and that you would let it thrive, Father, um, as you, by your spirit, tend to it and, and grow it and pour out, Lord, blessing and grace upon them. We just pray, Lord, for Christian, that you would uh, grant him, Lord, to be just continue to be a faithful leader. And we were, we've been so blessed, Lord, by his service here and his preaching. And, Lord, we just are looking forward to seeing that also just continue on uh, in this new body of believers that we are praying that you would uh, create here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you are welcome to turn to Romans chapter 2, verse 6 with me. And before I move on, just to, to uh, I didn't mention this in the announcement for the mothers, but if you are a mother, we do have roses for you in the back. So we would normally pass those out uh, because of Corona times. We're just not passing many things out now for obvious reasons. But if you're a mother, you're welcome to take a rose. That is our gift to you to say thank you for all you do um, because you are you are valued and we know that your work uh, is indispensable. Um, so if you if you're in Romans chapter two, verse six, that's where we'll be beginning. Let me read that for us today. In it, Paul writes, he will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience and well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. But there will be there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we know that these are words, Lord, that do not sound very pleasant on Western modern ears. But we ask, Lord, that we would faithfully and humbly submit ourselves to your truth and recognize who you are and what you have ordained to take place. And we pray, Lord, that uh, as we, we preach from your word today, that you would grant your truth uh, to, to go forth Lord, and to bear fruit, Lord, so that we ourselves may bear fruit as this, as this passage speaks about. May you be glorified, Father, and we just ask that your name would be exalted in all that we do. For we are here for no other name but to see Jesus Christ magnified, to know him, and to follow him in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well... There's a, a document called the Didache, and it's one of the earliest Christian documents uh, that was used for discipling new believers before they would present themselves for baptism in the early church. And in that document, the first thing it says is there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between these two ways. That's a striking introduction for a book about discipleship, because it defines the choice that stands before every person. Either we walk the path of life with God, or we walk the path of death in opposition to him. And it's not as if there's a few similarities in these ways uh, and between these two. There's not crossover, but they are absolutely and utterly distinct. They're not comparable because these two ways are the difference between life and death, as the Didache says. Or as scripture also says, between light and darkness, truth and lies, good and evil, holiness and sin, faith and faithlessness. There are, is only these two roads. There is not a third for us to take. 
And that's not reductionistic. That is the gospel. Jesus said that there is a wide gate to destruction and narrow gate to life. Entering the gate of life through Christ culminates in partaking in God's own life. And entering the gate of destruction because of our love for sin ends in distress and wrath and fury, as Paul says. It's these two distinct paths and their end that Paul is drawing our attention to today in this text. Two ways. One that shepherds us into eternal life and another that drags us into destruction. And what I want us to consider today is three things in connection to what Paul's written here. First, I want us to ask the preliminary question, what is the role of faith in this text? Since Paul says God renders his judgment according to our works. So where does faith fit into this judgment? Second, I want to to flesh out and bring some clarity to these two different paths that Paul speaks on. One that leads to eternal life and one that leads to destruction. And third, I want to look at verse 11, where Paul says God shows no partiality when judging us. And then following that, I just want to offer two exhortations for us before leaving. But let's begin by turning to the role that faith plays in this text. One of the questions that arises after, I think, a first reading of this is, why is Paul silent on faith? Why does he frame judgment in the context of works and not in the context of faith? Why why does he say in verse 6, God will render to each one according to his works, rather than saying God will render to each one according to his faith? It's an interesting distinction. Isn't this the Apostle Paul? This is the man who was called and sent to suffer for the sake of faith among the Gentiles, to see the gospel take root in the hearts of men so they may know Christ. Isn't that the purpose of this great book of Romans, to display God's redeeming grace through faith in Christ? So why then is Paul framing the judgment around our works and not faith in Christ? Well, first off, when Paul Paul speaks about God judging according to our works uh, and our actions, he's using the same language that Scripture itself uses throughout. All the scriptural witness points and says the same thing as Paul does here. We can also say that Paul is not advocating for a view where our good deeds uh, must outweigh our evil ones. It isn't a matter of our works meriting salvation or being put on a a scale to see uh, ultimately which way they lean. That type of thinking is is totally foreign to to scripture and the biblical text. Since faith, a genuine love and trusting in God, that has always been the, the road and the grounding for which people have fellowship with the Lord. Rather, God's rendering according to works, I think, is based upon our life being caught up in Jesus' life and transformed by his righteousness. Or his rendering is based on our persistence in self-determined and in Christ-forsaking, in a Christ-forsaken commitment to sin. So it isn't that Paul is neglecting the role of faith in judgment in this text, but he's assuming its implicit presence in the works of our lives. According to Romans 1, 16, 17, which was preached on a few weeks ago, faith is to be the understood grounding by which God gives life to us. In it, Paul writes, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, and the righteous shall live by faith. So Paul has already established that life with God comes through being united to Christ through faith, and that escape on the day of wrath comes through the gospel alone. So that's already been confirmed here in Paul's argument in Romans. So we certainly now can't look at this passage and disassociate it from what Paul's already said, because it's a building argument. Uh, We can't look as though that he's saying that life with God could somehow be obtained and merited through virtue apart from faith. Because the point is, there is no God-glorifying work or, or virtue apart from faith. Only 
a self-seeking type of virtue or, or, or work that is distorted and it's not true righteousness. And God takes no pleasure in those things because it isn't a true reflection of his character. But it's sin seeking justification. So even though Paul doesn't mention faith by name here, we should understand that faith is present. Because some sort of faith resides in every work that you do. In all your works, all your thoughts, all your speech, all your actions, all of it is the fruit of some faith. Be it faith in Christ or your favorite idol, whatever that might be. And of course, Paul's argument thus far in Romans has been that we all are idolaters who through our unrighteousness have committed ourselves to all kinds of fraudulent faiths and to sinful works because of that. So when God judges us according to our works, that isn't done independent of faith. But the works judged will either herald our faith in Christ or display our contempt for Christ. Christ alone is the one who turns God's wrath away from us. He is our propitiation, as Paul will say later. Jesus himself says in Matthew 16, 27, that he will repay each person according to what they have done when he comes in his glory. And in Matthew 7, 19, Jesus says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And when Jesus and Paul say these things, they're not discounting faith because it is our faith that determines the fruit and the work that will be judged in that day. So it's a mistake to disconnect our works from faith as though they inhabit different spheres or spaces or they function independently of one another. That, that isn't the picture that we get in scripture. Faith determines whether we produce good fruit or bad fruit. Because nothing we do occurs in a space that is devoid of some type of faith. By nature, we are worshiping creatures. And therefore, every thought, every step, everything that you do throughout the day, the way you eat, the way you spend your time, all of it is done in service to some type of faith, either to Christ or to something or someone else. And if that, that faith in Jesus then that is, that is what our will, uh, um, and if, if that faith is in Jesus, then our work will mirror what verse 7 has already said. There will be patience and well-doing that is seeking glory and honor and immortality. If that faith is in anyone or anything else, then the work will be that of verse 8. It will be self-seeking, disobedient to the truth, and obedient to unrighteousness. So now let's, let's take a little closer look at the works that will be judged and the just rewards that come from that. In verse 7, the first thing Paul says concerning those who inherit eternal life is that they are patient in well-doing. And let me unpack that phrase a little bit because it may be a little bit ambiguous. What Paul is getting at when he speaks of patience is a steadfastness, an endurance, a persistence while engaged in the trials and the struggles of this life. As one commentator said, uh, this word for patience, it, it denotes an active and a manly fortitude that, that would be used of a soldier who is in battle. So it's a type of determined battlefield mentality that Paul is talking about in the midst of warfare against sin, the flesh, and the powers of darkness. And when Paul speaks of well-doing, as the ESV translates it, that could just also easily be translated good work. So if we're going to define what well-doing or good work is in the fullest Christian understanding, it's simply a total devotion to imitating Christ. As Jesus says in John 14, 12, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do. Imitation of, of Christ is the summation of the Christian life and good work. Any deviation from it is to enter into the realm of unrighteousness and destruction. What's also, though, interesting is how Paul affirms the goodness of wanting glory and honor and immortality, because he says that these are things we are actively seeking through these works. 
But we, as followers of Christ, we don't pursue them in the way that the world would pursue those things. We don't seek glory and honor by subjugating people or oppressing them. We don't do it by exalting ourselves or by rooting our life in this world or by seeing our, our social media posts go viral or by obtaining a notable position. But we pursue glory, honor, and immortality through the cross, through death, and, and submitting ourselves and entrusting ourselves to the Father. We submit ourselves to the sacrificial love that was demonstrated by Christ on the cross. And, and as what the Lord renders, what the Lord will render from that is eternal life, according to Paul. That we may dwell forever with him. And that, that he may be our ever-present father and we may be his ever-worshipping children. And from here, Paul turns to the alternative then. And he starts to describe the path of wrath and fury. And he describes it as self-seeking. A way that rejects the truth and clings to unrighteousness. Unless we forget what Paul has been arguing in the early parts of, of Romans up until now. This is the natural state of every person because of our inborn sin. Which compels us to reject the Father. And suppress a knowledge of God. So when we the readers get to this point in the text. And Paul starts to speak about this self-seeking. And disobeying the truth. And loving unrighteousness. If, we're, if we've been paying attention. We need to recognize that verse 8. Should, it should stand out to us. Because it's speaking about us. Apart from the gospel. Because it's not just presenting an alternative to the gospel. It's describing the natural end that all people are bound for apart from the saving work of Christ. And these verses remind us that apart from God's grace, no one will seek glory. No one will seek immortality. No one will seek true honor that, that verse 7 outlines for us. Since, as Paul has already said, all have exchanged the glory of the immortal God... For fading glory in perishable things. And that is exactly why those who put their trust in lifeless idols will not inherit life. Because they've entrusted themselves to lifeless things. And those things have no power to do anything for them. The only power that an idol has is to dehumanize the person who worships it. By leading them further away from the God of life. And corrupting them so they, they'll be, so they become less and less like the father of all glory. And they can be, go, walk further and further away from the one whom they were created to know and cherish and worship. But what is this self-seeking uh, and, and obedience? What does self-seeking and obedience to unrighteousness look like? Well, to begin, it, it doesn't value Jesus. It takes the gospel Lightly, It doesn't magnify Jesus as the greatest treasure and the greatest beauty and, and our greatest good. He isn't honored as the saving Lord whom we are obliged to serve and to worship and to enjoy and to obey. And here again, I want to turn to the, the Didache because there's an interesting passage in it. And I think that it's one of the most comprehensive and yet succinct descriptions of, of what a wrath, uh, of what a life that leads to wrath looks like. In it, the early church wrote, And the way of death is this. First of all, it is evil and completely cursed. Murders, adulteries, lusts, sexual immoralities, thefts, idolatries, magic arts, sorceries, robberies, false testimonies, hypocrisies, double-heartedness, deceit, pride, malice. Self-will, greed, obscene language, jealousy, overconfidence, arrogance, boastfulness, persecutors of good, hating truth, loving a lie, not knowing the reward of righteousness, vigilance not for what is good, but for what is evil, from whom gentleness and patience are far removed, loving vanities, pursuing rewards, not pitying a poor man. Not laboring for the oppressed, not knowing him that made them, 
murderers of children, destroyers of God's creation, turning away from someone in need, afflicting him that is distressed, advocates of the rich, judges, lawless judges of the poor, utterly sinful. So that's how the early church in one of its original discipling documents defined those that reject truth and are obedient to unrighteousness. And this is a comprehensive depiction. And I hope that we all recognize that that in that description, we're all guilty. Not one of us reads that and walks away saying, well, I guess I'm good. I'm not pursuing the the path of death. That that just described all our lives. And, And we stand condemned under the righteousness of God. Because that is a standard that no one abides by. Because instead of walking from those things, we run to those things. As Paul emphasized earlier in chapter 2, none of us may excuse ourselves from being partakers in what would be defined as the way of wrath or the way of death. However, it is precisely out of this death that Christ has saved us. We walked in the depths of darkness, relishing many of that poisoned fruit. All you have to do is think back to the earliest parts of Genesis. But in Christ's sovereign grace, he descends to rescue us. And he brings us into the light of life. Where good fruit, where heavenly fruit, where Christ-exalting fruit may flourish in abundance. And no longer are we obedient slaves to unrighteousness destined for wrath, tribulation, and distress, and fury. But we are those who through God's grace and the indwelling power of the Spirit persevere in imitating the love of God and become partakers in his nature and his kingdom through the work of the Spirit in our lives. Without Jesus, this is impossible. As the apostles said, how can anyone be saved? As Jesus said, with with man, this is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. From him, there is freedom from sin, strength for godliness, life everlasting, fellowship with God. But those are not things any single person can do apart from his grace. Now, let's look at the final verse in this passage, verse 11, where Paul says, God shows no partiality. And right before that, Paul writes, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Now what Paul is doing is assuring us of God's justice here. Because when people hear that God will judge them, as some of us may be here today, inevitably, our unrighteousness will naturally be be provoked within us to question the validity of that judgment. Can he really do that justly? Does he really have the right? But Paul is saying God is the only just and rightful judge. And it doesn't matter if someone's a Jew or a Greek, rich or poor, a cultural outcast, or a cultural insider. Jesus will render each person according to their works, no matter who they are. He can't be bribed and he can't be deceived. He is a faithful judge. And when he judges you, you can be assured his judgment is true, right, and good. No person, no matter whether they enter into eternal life or subject to his wrath, will be served in justice by him, since he is fully committed to righteously distributing justice in full to everyone. Of course, we know justice isn't always done in our world, and and, and often it probably isn't at all for many people. But no one will be able to evade the justice of God. The day the Lord, as Scripture sometimes calls the judgment, will be the final vindication for justice. So that all in holiness shall be punished and the grace of the gospel heralded as many enter in, in as many enter into eternal life because of what Jesus has done. 
And because of all he did to save sinners like us from being the recipients of wrath. In order that we might be adopted as sons and daughters. In order that he might take us out of the kingdom of darkness and into his kingdom of light. And building on that astounding gospel truth that our sin rightfully warrants the wrath of God. But becoming partakers in eternal life. And becoming partakers in the righteousness of Christ. How that draws us into fellowship with the Father on his initiative. I want to encourage all of us just to be in awe of God's grace today. If you've passed from death into life through the gospel. And God's wrath no longer rests on you. It's no longer being stored up as we read last week. But if you are a son and daughter of the king. That is not your doing no one chooses to be born everyone is a bystander when they are born if you have been born anew in christ it is him working in you for your salvation and this is god's gracious election to life he is the one who has saved us from death he has set his love on you and called you to himself that you might imitate him in his holiness and know him in his glory and share in his immortality and his glory forever. That he might be your God and you might be his child. Does that amaze you? Because it is amazing. There is nothing more amazing that you will ever hear that God has set his love on you because we don't deserve it. We all are aware of who we are and him and his holiness it's an astounding thing apart from jesus each of us rightfully deserves on this day that paul has written about to be recipients of tribulation and distress and that might be hard to hear but it's true and we all need to acknowledge it because if we don't recognize it, then our worship will be hindered. If we don't understand what Jesus has saved us from, our worship and our praising of him, our understanding of the gospel, it'll be impaired. It'll be incomplete. And as a pastor of this church, my desire is for all of you to, to see your worship of God intensified with ever greater devotion. So that your worship isn't cut off at the knees. Because you don't realize what you've been saved from. That, that, that God has given you unmerited grace. You're probably familiar with the phrase, and they lived happily ever after. It's a beautiful sentiment found in some fantasy stories, I suppose. Don't know which ones, I can't remember. Maybe Shrek said it somewhere. But as we're all aware, that is a far cry from what we experience in this difficult world. Does, does even a single day end like that? And it's because life under the sun is often mingled with bitterness because of the sin and the unrighteousness that we ourselves have woven into our lives. But one of the amazing things about God's grace is that it makes that, that sentimental phrase, happily ever after, absolutely and eternally true. For all the people of God. It's not just the ending of a fantasy story. But it's eternal reality for all who have been brought to God through the gospel. However, while I pray that you are in awe of that grace that is demonstrated through the gospel. I also want you to take God's wrath with the utmost seriousness. Because it will be a dreadful and terrifying thing. For all, those, for all those who are enemies of Jesus on the day of judgment. We must earnestly desire to see people know Christ so that they may escape God's coming wrath. We can't be merely spectators in this world, but we must be witnesses. To dwell on the severity of God's wrath, I just let me read a few passages. From scripture, from Isaiah, Matthew, and Revelation. God's own word on the matter. Because I think it's important 
that we hear these words because we do not want to forget them. We can't just keep them over there somewhere while we focus on other things here. Because the reality is that your neighbor, these things that we are about to read, your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your parents, these might be true for them if they do not know Jesus as their savior. Isaiah 66, just a few verses from it. It's written, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by Yahweh shall be many. And the people of God shall go out and look on the dead bodies of men who have rebelled against God. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and those slain by Yahweh shall be many. And an abhorrence to all flesh. In Matthew 25, I have a couple verses from that. These are Jesus' words. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17, Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and among the rocks and the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? And then finally, Revelation 20, verses 10 to 15. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and the lake, this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We should have a holy fear of God's wrath. If there is anything to be feared in all creation, it is that. As the author of Hebrews says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I encourage you this week, meditate on these things. Med meditate on the immensity of God's grace. And meditate on the horror of his wrath. Perhaps this week, come back, read Romans 2, verses 6 to 11, or read the end of Isaiah. Read Revelation. God's judgment may not be something that we contemplate often, but it's important to remember because it will feed our urgency to be a witness to the gospel. And it will let us truly behold the holiness and the righteousness and the grace of God. 
Judgment awaits every person. Every one of us standing here, we will all stand before the king. And may we never be content, though, to see people walk ignorantly into that judgment, not knowing the Holy One who will be there. As Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, warned his executioners before being burned at the stake of that fire and the eternal punishment that awaits the godly, so follow his example. And, and, and do not allow those in your life to be ignorant of the gospel. And what is at stake if they reject it? Jesus is king. And there will be no escape from justice apart from him. For the sake of justice, he suffered the cross. He bore our sin. He bore the punishment that was rightly due to us. And because of him, because of his work, you do not have to experience that punishment, but you will be a son and daughter of the king. You will be an inheritor of eternal life. Remember these things. And in closing, just, I want to encourage those of you, maybe all of us, who are uncomfortable with the idea of God's wrath. If that makes you uncomfortable, it's understandable. It's not an easy subject. You don't even hear it preached in churches often. The places that are meant to be heralding the truth, often wrath, punishment, those things don't even go named. So it's understandable that many are uncomfortable. But I want to encourage you that if that's the case, spend some time exploring God's character. Spend some time delving in and understanding sin and unrighteousness. Because if you understand the character of God and the glory of God and the holiness of God, his great love, his great sovereignty, his righteousness, if you understand these things, wrath will not be an enigma. It will be perfectly understandable. And you will see how it is perfectly just. And when you understand the depth of sin, how evil and dark sin truly is, you understand that wrath is perfectly acceptable in the face of such disgusting, disgusting things. Because sin is truly disgusting. It's maybe a weird word to use in connection with sin. But God is beauty. There is nothing beautiful but him. And sin is the opposite. It is pure ugliness and disgusting. It has no place in God's presence. So for those of you, again, who may struggle with this idea of God's wrath, if it makes you uncomfortable, dive into the scriptures or find a good theologian or a good a good theologian who, who, who has written on God's character. Explore these things. And wrath, what Paul has written about, it will not put you off. But you will see how it is the perfect understanding of who God is. In Revelation, the saints actually proclaim their desire to see their blood avenged. And that is because justice is good. Let me pray for us. Father, you are great and you are holy. We understand, Father, from all that Paul has written and all that we've looked at over the past couple weeks, that we are not holy people, that we are not a righteous people. We are a people, Father, who have committed ourselves to unrighteousness and suppressing the truth our lives, Father, we recognize that before you and apart from Christ, they have no place before you. But we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the glory of Jesus. And Lord, yes, we know these things are hard. They're hard to speak about. They're hard to fathom. But we ask for your help. 
Lord, that we would truly abide by what you have said. We would not reject the truth, Lord, that we would not suppress the truth of your judgment. But may we trust in you and look to you and abide in you forever and ever. May we place all our trust in Jesus, knowing that apart from him, there is no refuge. And as we read in, in Revelation, those who do not have Jesus to hide and will try to hide under the mountains and the rocks in fear. Yet we praise you, Father, that we have no fear because of Jesus, but can walk into your presence with joy and knowing that we are yours. Glorify your name, Father. Glorify your name. This text reminds us that you are a great and holy God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we reflect on uh, the message from today, please stand and we will sing the song, Only a Holy God.
worship the holy God forever and only God. Benediction comes from number six. Just as I read this, just take particular pleasure in this today because God's blessing and peace rest upon you because of Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, mothers, remember that you can grab a rose on the way out and that we will have a fellowship hour out there. We'll see you out there. Mm -hmm.